60 years ago for 13 days humankind remained on edge with the possibility of nuclear annihilation as two superpowers locked horns around the island nation of Cuba welcome to the why in history i am aj call and today we are talking about this incident that had the world on edge in october of 1962 the cuban missile crisis my apologies for the sudden change in topic for this episode but recent developments necessitated that we talk about this incident ahead of the proposed one so the cuban missile crisis happened against a backdrop of growing mistrust between the united states and the soviet union mistrust which reached a new level after the u2 spy incident in may 1960 an american u2 spy reconnaissance aircraft was shot over soviet territory in may of 1960 and its pilot gary powers captured alive and this led to president dwight eisenhower having to admit to the soviets that the us had been flying spy missions over the soviet union for several years and subsequently soviet premier nikita khrushchev walked out of the paris summit between the us france great britain and soviet union on may the 14th stating that he could no longer cooperate with president eisenhower and just as dwight eisenhower had felt that harry truman was too soft on the soviets the new presidential candidate jfk felt that eisenhower had been too soft on soviets and that the technological gap with respect to defense equipment had widened in favor of the soviet union the reality though was that the nuclear balance and the missile gap was overwhelmingly in america's advantage and this had been proved by the u2 spy missions that were conducted over soviet territory by the americans and soviet premier nikita khrushchev too was aware of america's advantage not just in the number of weapons but in the quality and the deployments as well we want everyone to know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house that was john f kennedy delivering his inaugural speech in january of 1961 and the reason for that statement was that khrushchev had promised cuba full support of the soviet union in case there was an aggression from the united states and jfk did not want any soviet presence in the western hemisphere in april of 1961 less than 3 months after taking office president john f kennedy approved a plan that had been initiated during the presidency of dwight eisenhower to overthrow fidel castro's regime in cuba 1400 cuban exiles trained and equipped by the cia landed on the southern coast of cuba at the bay of pigs to initiate an invasion to overthrow castro but the mission failed miserably and overnight cuba became a poster child for resisting a superpower and subsequently the relationship between the us and the soviet union became more tense and khrushchev who was under a lot of pressure from his own communist party to be tougher with the united states started getting paranoid about potential loss of face if he lost cuba and besides the advantage that the us possessed over soviet union with respect to intercontinental missiles the united states also had a home advantage in the sense it had missiles pointed at soviet union from very close to just across the border in the united kingdom 
Italy and Turkey. And when Khrushchev pondered on how to defend Cuba for the Soviet Union, deployment of missiles pointed at the United States seemed to be one way of reducing the Soviet disadvantage. On October 14, 1962, a U-2 reconnaissance plane took off from Edwards Air Force Base to take high-level photos over western Cuba. In a field near the village of San Cristobal, the photos clearly showed 30 feet long medium range Soviet nuclear missiles. Not ready to fire, but almost there. And these missiles had the ability to hit deep inside US mainland, including New York and Washington. When President Kennedy was shown these photos, his immediate response was that something had to be done. So a group was assembled to advise on the crisis and this group was called the Executive Committee of the National Security Council or XCOM. So you had the top level advisors like the Vice President, the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, all in one room debating the options. The team felt that this issue was less military and more of political significance, mainly because it was altering the balance of power between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it was not acceptable to the United States that Soviet Union was doing what they had already done to the Soviet Union. Several options were placed on the table and discussed. Uh, One of the first was from Robert Kennedy, and that was an all-out invasion of Cuba, and making sure that the mistakes of the Bay of Pigs episode were not repeated. But according to his plan, an excuse had to be created to initiate the attack, like sinking of a naval vessel and blaming it on Cuba or the Soviet Union. Former Secretary of State Dean Acheson and CIA Director John McCone argued for a direct airstrike to take out the missiles before they became operational. When asked how the Soviets would respond to that, they mentioned, well, they'll probably take out our missiles in Turkey. A more moderate option was to initiate a naval blockade of Cuba and threaten an invasion if the missiles were not removed. The United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, argued against any military action and instead opened the door for negotiations with Khrushchev. He suggested that the US should trade Guantanamo Bay and the missiles in Turkey for the Soviet missiles in Cuba. This proposal was rejected outright by the XCOM because they felt it was too much too soon. So while the deliberations were going on, on day four of the crisis, a low-level reconnaissance aircraft flying over Cuba brought back new evidence of a site of a much longer-range nuclear missile, which could hit 98% of the US mainland. And the Soviets seemed to be working around the clock to get these operational before they were discovered. At this point, the time for debates and discussions was over and the team had to swing into action. A secret order was issued to the armed forces to prepare for action and the Navy was asked to impose a blockade, a line in the ocean beyond which ships carrying arms would not be allowed. On Monday, October 22, 1962, which was day seven of the crisis, Kennedy broke the news to the nation and announced the imposition of the blockade to deal with the crisis. Back in Moscow, Khrushchev was very surprised by the American response. Almost to the point, like he had never thought 
of how the Americans would react. Fidel Castro, meanwhile, mobilized all his troops and called President Kennedy a pirate for imposing the blockade. The US military was put on the second highest alert, that is DEFCON 2, which means we are at the next step to war or a nuclear threat. During this alert level, the US armed forces are ready and prepared to ship out in six hours or less. With this alert in place, 57 armed nuclear bombers were put in the air on a round-the-clock mission. Their primary mission was to keep an eye out for the Soviet ships as they started approaching the blockade line. Actually, 25 Soviet ships were on their way to Cuba. Khrushchev was counting on his submarines to protect the 25 ships from being stopped by the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy, though, had a technique for locating subs. It would drop small explosives near the subs and listen to their sonar echoes and follow them until they surfaced. Six subs were located this way and brought to the surface. Now, we must also take a look at the leadership and management of the core crises by JFK and his team. Now, situations which are as fluid as this can easily escalate and create a point of no return. So it is super important to over-communicate with the people on the front line. And that is exactly what President JFK and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara did. Robert McNamara met with the naval commanders and made it very clear to them that the U.S. was not trying to start a war. We are just sending a political message so no shots could be fired. President Kennedy took it even a step further and was on a direct line with the commander of the lead Navy ship to get first-hand information from him on what was going on near the blockade line. The Soviet ships were approaching and everybody waited with bated breath. At 10.25 a.m., October 24th, 1962, 12 of the Soviet ships suddenly stopped dead in the water. Once the naval commander had reaffirmed that the ships had indeed stopped, everyone let out a sigh of relief. The immediate crisis had been averted. The reinforcements had been stopped. But 42 missiles and warheads were already on the island. So one could not tell for sure that these were not already armed. The crisis was not over yet. The next day at the UN Security Council, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Adlai Stevenson displayed the U-2 photographs for the rest of the world to see for the first time. He confronted his Soviet counterpart, Zorin, asking him if he denied that the Soviet Union had placed medium-range missiles in Cuba. Following that up with, yes or no. Don't wait for the translation, yes or no. The Soviet ambassador denied their presence. But after the showdown at the UN Security Council, there was a sudden uptick in the two parties talking to each other. It started with Soviet KGB chief in Washington reaching out to ABC reporter John Scalley and asking him if the US government would be open to the missiles being taken down under UN supervision. And soon after that, the White House received a teleprinter message from Nikita Khrushchev himself talking about not pulling the ends of the rope so much that none of them had the ability to untie it. Yeah, the tone was very philosophical. 
and it seemed to have been written by Nikita Khrushchev himself under tremendous pressure. But the next morning on October the 27th, the White House received another message from Khrushchev. And this one said that the Soviets would remove the missiles from Cuba only if the Americans would halt the blockade, promise never to invade Cuba, and also promise to remove its missiles from Turkey. Interesting, because it seems very similar to what was suggested by UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson during the deliberations at the beginning of the crisis. So while the leadership was deliberating next steps, there was concern that an error in judgment by any of the personnel on the front lines could trigger a war. And while they were deliberating, news of such an accident came in. An American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba by a Soviet surface-to-air missile. Its pilot, Air Force Major Rudolf Anderson, was killed, becoming the first casualty of this crisis. And this was followed by another U-2 plane narrowly making it safely back while flying over the Soviet Union. Now the concern among the leadership was that the Soviets were probably thinking that the Americans were getting ready for war. The situation had really escalated. Later that same night, fearful of the escalation into a war, JFK sent Robert Kennedy to meet up with the Soviet ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. JFK was willing to accept Khrushchev's conditions. If the Soviets removed the missiles from Cuba, the US would promise never to invade Cuba. And there was a secret assurance too. President Kennedy had decided to remove the obsolete missiles from Turkey a while back. But these could not be removed now since that would undermine the NATO alliance. But Premier Khrushchev had the president's assurance that the missiles would be removed in due course. And along with the carrot came the stick. If the Soviets did not agree to this within 48 hours or downed any other U-2 plane the U.S. would proceed with its plan to invade Cuba. And once again, Kennedy did a great job of risk management. He had a plan B, which was a public exchange of the missiles in Turkey for the missiles in Cuba. And after the message was communicated to the Soviet ambassador, all one could do was wait, hope, and pray. On Sunday, October the 28th, day 13 of the crisis, Radio Moscow broadcast the news that Premier Khrushchev had sent a message to President Kennedy that the missiles in Cuba would be dismantled from Cuba and returned to the Soviet Union. The world had just survived a potential nuclear catastrophe. While the whole world celebrated, there was one man who was very upset at this decision. Cuban leader Fidel Castro. And he was upset not because of the de-escalation, but because he felt like a bargaining chip between the two superpowers. Since he was not even consulted by Khrushchev before the final announcement was made. Soon, the missiles were back in the Soviet Union and within six months, the missiles in Turkey were dismantled. And the immediate lesson learned and implemented out of this crisis was the establishment of the hotline between Washington DC and Kremlin in Moscow. On August 30th, 1963, the White House issued a statement that the new hotline would help reduce the risk of war occurring 
by accident or miscalculation. The primary aim though was to reduce or remove the reliance on telegram letters and instead pick up the phone and be instantly connected 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And it is on this note that we end this section of the program. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. Based on the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index of 2021, which country is the most democratic and which one is the least democratic? Based on the 2021 index, Norway is considered to be the most democratic and Afghanistan the least democratic. So the answer is C, Norway and Afghanistan. Incidentally, of the 167 countries surveyed, just 21 were deemed to be full democracies and 53, including the United States, fell into the category of flawed democracies. Question for today's episode. Who became the first US president to use the hotline to communicate with his Soviet counterpart? Was it A. John F. Kennedy, B. Lyndon B. Johnson, C. Richard Nixon, or D. Gerald Ford? Once again, who became the first US president to use the hotline to communicate with his Soviet counterpart? A. John F. Kennedy, B. Lyndon B. Johnson, C. Richard Nixon, D. Gerald Ford. The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in today's episode. In the next episode, we look at a crisis that erupted around the same time as the Cuban Missile Crisis, but in the Eastern Hemisphere. Yes, we will cover the India-China War of 1962 its origin, the outcome, and how it was brought to an end. Till then, stay safe and keep looking for the why in history.